All right, good afternoon. I already um, spoke this morning on this subject, so it's the same talk this afternoon in case you found yourself here. Um, but I am very happy to talk about, oops, I have to find my device, um, about obstetrical and gynecologic issues as they relate to connective tissue disorders and um, hypermobility syndromes. And I work with Dr. Claire Francomano, so I'm sure many of you know her and her work with this organization. Um, but I am an OBGYN geneticist here at GBMC, a little north of Baltimore. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is review the gynecologic and obstetrical issues seen um, with EDS and connective tissue uh, disorders, um, talk about gynecologic concerns, including um, pain, uh, organ prolapse, um, a little bit about what goes on in puberty, what goes on in sort of later GYN life, with, including sexually active women, fertility, menopause, and of course, talk about obstetrical um, issues throughout pregnancy, um, miscarriage, during pregnancy symptoms that can occur, complications to watch out for, things to monitor for, um, going right into delivery, and then postpartum concerns. Okay, so swinging right into puberty, favorite time of everybody's life. Um, Symptoms of connective tissue disorders themselves can become worse with puberty, not necessarily GYN issues, or some can begin at puberty. And there was recently a very nice study looking at a series of 386 women who had hypermobile um, type EDS and how their EDS symptoms, and their chronic pain and fatigue principally were what they were looking at, um, changed with puberty. Um, girls who were becoming women now, 52% of them who had prepubertal sin, um, symptoms became worse at, with puberty, and another 17% developed symptoms of EDS as they entered puberty. So puberty was not a good thing. Um, and then there are the gynecologic issues that accompany puberty. Um, mostly menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea. Those, were the those are the two main issues faced by um, people with connective tissue disorders. And um, it's a big problem for many. The menorrhagia heavy bleeding is estimated to be anything between 33 and 75 percent, but it tends to be a little bit on the higher end. Um, there's weakness in the capillaries and in the perivascular tissues. Um, that's one explanation. Um, in talking with Dr. Francomano, um, she was talking with me about the disorder of the interaction of platelets and collagen. So whatever the cause, um, heavy bleeding is very common um, with connective tissue issues. In addition with, um, and maybe hand in hand with a heavy bleeding, but painful menses dysmenorrhea occurs in these studies. You can see the range is even pushed up higher, 73 to 93%. Um, the thought is there's this release of prostaglandins from the lining of the uterus that's causing muscles and blood vessels of the uterus to contract. Uh, it's definitely ties into the heavier bleeding. So the more bleeding you're doing, the more pain you tend to have. And certainly one of the theories I always heard is, well, once you have a baby, it's all better. That cervix is opened and closed, and dysmenorrhea improves. And indeed, in most women, this primary dysmenorrhea, not most women, the general population, um, the dysmenorrhea improves um, with time as you get a little bit older, once you have children. Unfortunately, with connective tissue disorders, it just sticks with you throughout your entire menstrual life. So it's very important to try to treat that. And um, how can you treat it? It's the same treatment that we would use for everybody. You start out with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, that, that targets prostaglandins. The 
thing with these drugs, and we're talking about Motrin, Ponstil, Anaprox, that whole little family, is they work best if you give them the second you start menstruating or the second you, your cycle is beginning. So if you're a little bit late, it doesn't work well. Um, if you're irregular, it's maybe not the best drug for you because you may not catch things in a way that it's a helpful medication, but it does work. Um, and it will relieve nausea and diarrhea as well, which you can have with the menstrual cycle. Um, alternative treatments, vitamin B1, magnesium supplements, acupuncture, they're all, um, they've all been used, they work for some people, there aren't really good scientific studies, but it's something to consider. Um, but really, if these things don't work, hormonal treatment is usually what we go to. And we're talking about the birth control pill, the mini pill, which is progesterone only, or the IUD with progesterone, which is why I'm calling that a hormone. Um, and so with the birth control pill or progesterone only pill, um, and with the IUD with progesterone, all of them will, have, will help with the volume of bleeding and with the painful menses. Um, you can make that volume, you can kind of crank it down and just have light menstrual cycles. You can take the pill, um, like the mini pill, every day, no placebos, and suppress your period. Maybe only get one once every three months, maybe not get one at all. And so it's very effective. However, it does have estrogen in it. Estrogen itself is got maybe some uh, qualities of causing muscle relax, uh, not, rather not muscle relaxation, connective tissue relaxation specifically. So some individuals with um, EDS symptoms will improve 15% on the oral contraceptive pill, but some will worsen. Um, interestingly enough, 25% improved who were taking progesterone only in this one study. So it's something to consider if you've tried the birth control pill, you're still not feeling, maybe your periods are lighter, but in general, you're just feeling your, your symptoms are worsening to consider the mini pill. Um, and this was particularly individuals who had already found that around the time of their menstrual cycle, not only did they have painful menses, but that their EDS symptoms were worsening. Um, they're the ones who did not do well on the pill. Although, of course, 15% did, so you kind of have to try um, medication sometimes um, and figure it out how does it work for you. Okay, I'm not ignoring this side of the room. My little monitor is there, so I keep trying to turn. And then when I look this way, I'm completely blinded by the lights. So, it's, you know, it's like, are there three? Okay, there are three people attending the lecture. That's all I can see. All right, so anyway, um, unfortunately, not only do, do um, individuals suffer with painful menses, but also with vulvodynia. So that is chronic, and dyspareunia, which is discomfort with intercourse. Um, vulvodynia, pain, chronic pain, discomfort of the vulva, for which no obvious etiology can be found after, and it's got to have been going on for at least three months to get the diagnosis. Um, so it's not if you have a yeast infection and are all irritated or uh, some sort of other you know, chemical thing got on you and bothered you. No, this is something that cannot be explained. And it's very common. It's um, in this, in uh, connected, individuals with connective tissue disorders, 32 to 77%. Um, the, no one gets vulvodynia who has EDS or hypermobile um, issues unless they have dysmenorrhea. So it sort of ties into that whole pain cycle, and we don't really understand it. Is it peripheral sensitization of the vulva? There's certainly individuals who have a lot of swelling um, as one of their uh, um, symptoms, and is it related to that? Um, central nerve sensitivity is another issue. There's all these feedback cycles. You have, I think, some experts on pain here who can maybe explain it, but regardless, it's something that can be um, very disturbing to individuals. Um, I mentioned the edema. Some individuals get it just with intercourse and it lasts a couple of days afterwards. There's also a disorder called persistent genital arousal syndrome, and um, certainly patients like that have been seen um, at our um, clinic. Okay, so what can you do for it? 
uh, forgive me for the little diagram of the exercises, but anyway, so, but yes, Kegel, reverse Kegel exercises are very helpful and helpful for pelvic floor in general, something to consider for everybody. Um, but skin care, um, physical therapy, psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, um, it really takes an individual, it takes your general GYN maybe can take a look and figure out why um, this is going on or maybe rule out issues that can be treated easily like a yeast infection, as I mentioned. But once you're past that, you want to go to somebody who focuses and is kind of an expert in treating these disorders to sort through and who has a team of these um, folks to help treat and, um, and improve things. Um, medications can be anything from a topical anesthetic, even before intercourse, trying to help with that, uh, to you know, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicines, whatever combination can work to improve things. But it's not an easy fix, um, and it's quite a challenge. And how big a challenge? Why? Here are 120 treatments that somebody <laughs> posted. <laughs> you can find everything on Google. But anyway, you can see some of them don't belong there at all. We just said that, well, if you know what it is, so you're not treating with you know, antibiotics or antifungals aren't appropriate because that's a reason for having a problem. Um, the old bicycle thrown under the bus, but you know you can just see various things that don't work, but some things that do, including Botox, for example, is uh, another medication that's been um, effective. It's interesting. I just spotted that fasting is in the good column of effective things. I don't know, you're so weak that you can't. Um, I don't know what, where that comes from. All right, other GYN disorders aren't necessarily more common um, with. Um, hypermobility and um, EDS. Um, endometriosis studies go up to 23%, but it's probably closer to 6%, like the general population. Uterine myomas um, are five, or rather, yeah, five to 9%. Again, general population numbers, actually lower than the general population. Infertility, uh, um, no, that really doesn't seem to be increased. There's this one study that came up with hypermobile EDS, 48%, but it really hasn't been substantiated in any other study. So that, I don't think, is a concern. Um, menopause itself tends to be OK. The symptoms actually improve. Again, that estrogen's going down. So about 22% in this one study said they felt better once they went through menopause in terms of specifically symptoms of EDS. Um, although, interestingly enough, those who used hormonal therapy found some of them felt better on the hormones and their EDS symptoms. So again, it's an individual thing not to avoid hormonal treatment in particular. Um, all right, so then moving into obstetrics, now the fun begins, because now you, you, you've resolved the dyspareunia, and you've got your menstrual cycles feeling better, and actually now you're pregnant, so you don't have to have a menstrual cycle, but um, the hormones of pregnancy can really do a number on um, individuals with loose joints and connective tissue issues. Um, there's a hormone called relaxin produced during pregnancy that can really, it relaxes things, it relaxes joints and smooth muscle, um, so pre-existing joint um, laxity uh, becomes worse, more painful joints. Um, and so in like one series, I looked at pelvic girdle pain and instability, three times worse than general population in terms of how many needed treatment, spine pain, joint pain, low back pain, sacrum iliac joints, um, middle groin pain, radiating to the lower abdomen and hips. And that um, particularly involves the, wait, I have, I have to use my pointer at least once. Yes. No. Yeah, there. Hmm. Okay. It's not a good pointer user. Anyway, you can see the synthesis pubis on the... On your right. <laughs> okay, it took a while. And the, no time left. The lecture's over. It took enough time to figure that out now. Um, so anyhow, the symphysis pubis um, 
is wider open on the right, and it's all relaxed, and it's incredibly painful. So I was actually talking, somebody who attended, the, I gave this lecture again once earlier today, um, somebody mentioned she developed that symptom at 16 weeks of pregnancy, delightful. Um, so really uncomfortable. And you can try to wear support garments to help you through these things, but um, there's only so much that can do. So it, it is not a, a pleasant um, experience for some women. Now, other individuals may do fine in pregnancy. So we see people who say, no, they felt great. They felt better during pregnancy. They felt no different than they normally felt. So it's not that people are doomed to develop these issues, but there is certainly a risk that they will occur. And for folks who have POTS, um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, we worry about that being worse in pregnancy. Um, if, uh, if you're not familiar with it, that's where your heart rate increases 30 beats a minute or more, um, or it hits 120 beats a minute when you move from supine to upright position. Um, in pregnancy, there's peripheral vascular pooling the venous pooling, rather, and so your blood pressure is down, and so the POTS can actually be worse. Um, and symptoms include dizziness, nausea, um, fatigue, and of course the biggest concern is actually fainting, um, palpitations. So um, there's not only issues during pregnancy, but even with the pain of labor, it can be worse. And so it's really important for, um, let's see, the next slide has um, the experience uh, in one group. This was looking at high, folks who are hypermobile, not necessarily with the diagnosis of a specific connective tissue disorder. Two were labeled EDS. Um, of the 22 people who were looked at in the study, for example, again, POTS, 53% eh, said, I feel better pregnant. 31% felt worse. And of those, so now we're talking about seven individuals, Four of them said, actually, just the first trimester, when you tend to be a little more dehydrated and you, most people feel kind of nauseous and whatever anyway. So um, only three really felt worse throughout the pregnancy. What can you do? Salt and um, fluid intake. Make sure that in labor you get adequate anesthesia and also in labor avoid Valsalva during the second stage, that's where like you're really pushing and you know, your face is turning blue because you're pushing so hard and you're not breathing. No, not for the POTS pain. Not really for anybody, by the way, but if you have POTS, you're gonna just send yourself spinning off so, um, to avoid that. And of course, the usual advice of taking it nice and easy as you get up, dangle your feet, slowly get up, make sure you don't have sharp pointy things near your bed. So, you know, everything goes well as you move from that supine to standing position. Um, now, the miscarriage risk, I said recent studies, um, again, this French study with the th almost 400 people found no increased risk of miscarriage. However, other folks, um, other studies have shown higher rates. I think the general population risk is something like 15%, and they found 28%. Um, from my informal conversations with individuals after my lecture, people seem to think, eh, no, miscarriage is pretty common. So it's somewhere in there. It may not be the same as the population risk. It may be um, somewhat higher, but um, it's just another thing to keep an eye out for. And very little information about twins, but this one study had um, very poor outcomes. Three early losses, sort of late um, miscarriage, which means probably in that kind of 12 to 20 week range, and then one 29 week delivery. So if you're pregnant with twins, you're pregnant with twins, but um, if you're thinking about actually doing in vitro fertilization, make sure they transfer one embryo, not three embryos. You don't want to set yourself up if you can. Or even Clomid is a drug that's used to help fertility. Watch the dosing. Um, and then what other issues might you run into in pregnancy? The one that we've seen um, and is definitely significant no matter which form of a connective tissue disorder you might have is premature rupture of membranes. And that means rupturing the amniotic sac, 
This puts the fetus at risk for early delivery, but also for infection. So our current management is actually, if you happen to rupture at 35 weeks, you're gonna get delivered. If it's under 34 weeks, try to keep your pregnant until 34 weeks, but then be delivered because of concerns of infection. Um, and the thought is, in everyone, whether there's a connective, underlying connective tissue disorder or not, is there something about the amnion that's abnormal and the fibrils in the amniotic membrane is, uh, there's just a reduced number of them. The theory is with EDS that it's an altered, the fibrils themselves are altered, not necessarily a reduced number, that they are abnormal, and that's what predisposes people for this complication. And I found this pretty slide, and supposedly it is the fibroblast layer that is the one that's responsible, but there's collagen in the other layers as well. Um, and in terms of the risk, in this one study, Lynn, 2002, from the Netherlands, they looked at 264 pregnancies. And they, it was interesting, the 264 were in patients who had an EDS diagnosis. They also looked at 33 patients who did not have EDS and 107 pregnancies in that case, but whose children had EDS. So all those pregnancies had affected children, half of whom uh, approximately um, were new mutation, half it was a paternal mutation, so dad um, had the EDS. Interestingly enough, if the mom had EDS and the baby did not, they still had premature rupture of membranes in 20%. That's not trivial, that's a pretty significant number. But if the baby also had it, it went up to 35%. And if the mom did not have EDS, but the baby had EDS, again, a high number. In this case, it actually was 50%. So. Um, I don't know, it's, you would think that 35 and 50 should be about the same, but definitely an increased risk. And of course, the membranes are part of the pregnancy and are fetal in origin, so it makes sense that they, are ab they have the same abnormality that the fetus baby has. Um, in their series, they didn't see an incompetent cervix, but again, we've definitely seen it in patients with connective tissue disorder, so it's something to watch for. Um, and in particular in classical um, EDS. All right, and just uh, how often does this happen? That was one series. Another one um, looked at just uh, um, hypermobile EDS uh, in pregnancies out of 93 pregnancies, 11 had preterm deliveries. Um, Hearst was a series, I think, through this organization and found a 25% preterm delivery rate. So, um, Hugon, she's the one, <laughs> Hugon didn't find people have increased miscarriage, not much preterm delivery either. So, I don't know if her population's a little bit different because it doesn't quite match others' experience. Um, the other thing that's increased with um, Connective tissue disorders are breach presentations, more likely, so that means a C-section delivery, 8% compared to 3% in the general population. And then some of the affected babies will be, they call it floppy baby syndrome, where they kind of come out and they're just very loose. Well, those babies are, hey, they're loose inside too, so some of them will present either breach or brow presentation or um, a face presentation. So exciting in the delivery room, but these days it's a C-section. Um, so should everybody have C-sections? We'll just talk about that a little bit. Um, the quick answer is no, not everybody should have a C-section. So what's the point? Vaginal delivery, why is that good? Well, you're avoiding um, abdominal surgery. Um, wound healing is a real concern. Um, now, of course, we'll get to episiotomy in a second, but you know the healing for a cesarean, um, that's, a, that's a big major scar. So you want to try to perhaps avoid that in the more prolonged recovery. But is there a risk of perineal injury um, if you have a connective tissue disorder? Uh, yeah. So not only is there a risk that you could tear during the course of that second stage of labor as the baby's descending and you're pushing, even before the actual delivery, or during the delivery, 
or the episiotomy itself can tear and extend. So there is that risk with vaginal delivery. In addition, just like the cesarean scar may take a while to heal, the episiotomy may be a difficult healing process. The scar itself could be atrophic or a keloid. So there are, those issues are um, real. And precipitous delivery is another concern. So we're saying, OK, these are the injuries that can happen, but what about the delivery? Uh, well, the delivery itself can be very rapid. And again, that can result in the injuries we just described. And you don't necessarily get away without an episiotomy. And again, one person from the previous lecture mentioned that her own um, child was injured during the precipitous delivery. So it's not in the plus column of complications. Um, then the other, um, however, not everybody has found complications. Uh, for example, um, one study showed that women with hypermobility, now this is just hypermobility, they just did sort of a Biden score and didn't go any further in terms of coming up with a specific diagnosis. But hypermobile women were found actually to have less likely to need operative delivery. So once you make it to that second stage, you're probably good to go. You're not going to wind up with a C-section or um, need forceps or a vacuum. Um, they also, in their particular study, found that less sphincter injuries, and that's called a fourth-degree tear, where it goes through, or third-degree tear. Both of those go through the anal sphincter. Um, so they theorized that the joint laxity actually helped the fetal head descend through the pelvis in that group. Um, and they also found that the relative odds for any um, sort of pelvic uh, floor problems did not increase in that group. Now, they only followed people five, 10 years out from delivery. So that's a little bit of a question mark. Um, other things that can happen. You can have bleeding, the risk of hemorrhage, C-section, vaginal delivery, doesn't matter. Um, it can happen. And it doesn't have to be postpartum after delivery. And postpartum, I mean, is considered any 42 days, but most complications tend to happen a week after delivery. Um, but during labor, postpartum, um, so it's uh, something everybody needs to be keeping an eye out for. And if it happens, one of the drugs that's very effective is um, DDAVP. It's, a, it's not vasopressin, it's like desopressin. So it helps activate the platelets, and maybe it also constricts the vessels to some degree. But it's very good for uterine atony, and you want to be there in the hospital and make sure that this is not like sitting in the pharmacy at the next door hospital where they'll call for it if they need it. It should be on hand. Um, now, what about a C-section? Well, it's kind of nice not to labor, so that's a plus. Um, and then you're not gonna get these lacerations in the pelvis and episiotomies extending and all of that. But we already talked about, however, you have this wound that may be healing slowly, it might break down, um, abnormal scar formation. And again, um, in terms of that pelvic floor, I think that was on my next slide. There it is, preserving the pelvic floor. Um, there's, you know, people say, well, yeah, if I don't, um, do a vaginal delivery, then I'm going to have that nice bladder and rectum. Everything's going to stay the way it is, and it's going to be fine. But what we've seen is particularly with hypermobile um, EDS that if it's going to prolapse, if it's going to be a problem, if there's going to be um, bladder issues, they're going to happen whether you have a vaginal delivery or not. So it really doesn't, when you look at all the data, even though people do have these complications with the pelvic floor, it doesn't seem that avoiding a vaginal delivery will help you avoid those complications. They haven't really done good numbers of, you know, does it happen more often in one group than the other group, but it's probably not a reason to do a C-section. Um, the excessive, if you are, however, well, of course, if the baby is the breach or in a malpresentation that requires a cesarean delivery, um, excessive joint pain where you just cannot participate in a vaginal delivery, yeah, that's a reason to have a C-section. That's reasonable. Um, now, the other... Um, things So in terms of the things that we're seeing, 
just you know, like I'm, let's keep talking about this. Now, in terms of, so the risk of pelvic prolapse in the studies was 15 to 30%, um, and the weakened pelvic floor, I already said, so a cystocele bladder um, distension, stress urinary incontinence, and I know there's a lecture later today. Um, uh, were you in my other lecture? I got the 10 minute sign. I don't think it appeared in the other one, but maybe, but thank you. Um, I think that's when my computer was melting down in the other room, so nobody was flashing signs. Anyhow, so the stress urinary incontinence, there is a lecture by a GYN urologist later today, so if that is an issue you're interested in, um, you can get a lot of expert information there, but that was also seen. Um, so pelvic floor exercises may help and maybe something to think about doing in general. And um, as I already said, prolapse can happen whether or not you have a vaginal delivery if you have a connective tissue disorder. Um, and that is even in patients who have not had children and even if you're a 16-year-old teenager, like one study I read where somebody just um, had a bladder come falling out just because. So as a 16-year-old, yeah. All right. Um, now, so what manage, What can you do, though, to uh, try to mitigate and reduce um, the problems you can run into? Um, one is for that second stage of labor when you're pushing the baby out. This is not the time to you know, really do that strong valsalva as I described and really try with all your might to have that baby come out in one solid 20-second push. Instead, gentle pushing, we're kind of using just your urge to push in the normal way rather than somebody sort of pounding away and timing you and having you push as hard as you can. So to try that approach, um, and you, know, you want to find, make sure that at the hospital where you're delivering, that the labor and delivery staff, or, um, either the L&D nurses or you know, nurse midwives or doulas or your own obstetrician understand that that's the plan and that it's the way to go. Um, with the, we already mentioned with the pelvic relaxation, um, or rather not the pelvic relaxation, but with, well, yeah, the connective tissue joint relaxation that the delivery, the baby may be accommodated by the pelvis a little bit better. So the balance of the two works out. Um, positioning should be appropriate, and you have to be careful, especially um, to avoid overextending the hips, and if you're under an anesthetic, to avoid um, an unusual position that would um, create issues and injuries because you can't feel what you're doing, so to be very vigilant about that. Um, in addition, tissue should be handled very gently. Um, retention sutures, permanent sutures, and even stay in for two weeks and then you um, cut them out again on your post-op visit are the way to go. These little dissolving sutures, um, yeah, they'll dissolve and the wound's going to open up. So it's really important. This is something to outline with your physician ahead of time and have the plan in place and the supplies in place. Um, And now, just to say something about specific um, EDS diagnoses, with classical EDS, the cervical incompetence, where the cervix just pops open on, of its own accord, sort of, um, due to the weak collagen, has been seen to occur. It can occur with hypermobile as well. So you do regular ultrasounds looking at the cervix every um, couple of weeks, uh, sort of between 16 and 20 weeks especially, to try to avoid that and to catch it, but it's not recommended just to, oops, just to put a stitch in the cervix to prophylactically prevent something because the complication from the stitch is more likely to happen than help out um, if there's a problem needs to be treated. Um, they also tend to have particularly severe episiotomy extensions and perineal tears, so maybe with classical EDS, the C-section is a consideration for that reason. Um, and then pelvic prolapse is a problem for this population as well, in particular in treatment. You know, we talked about Kegels and all those exercises, but somehow just not as effective with the classical form. Um, vascular EDS, of course, is the one that we worry about the most because blood vessels rupture, bad things happen, um, and they can rupture during pregnancy. So certainly there's a risk of arterial rupture, 
um, during the pregnancy, in labor, postpartum, and specifically um, uterine rupture can occur in, during any of those times. Bleeding, which we talked about, but tends to be more common and more severe with vascular EDS, as well as, of course, premature rupture of membranes. Also, preeclampsia, more common, at least in one little study with this form, can happen to anybody, but more common there. And one series, a very good series, because it used to be, oh my God, vascular EDS, you're pregnant, you're going to die. No. It's a serious issue if you have vascular EDS, you need to think about a pregnancy, but in their series, they found actually 48% were completely uncomplicated. The complications they saw, 22% preterm delivery, 21% that episiotomy that goes into the anus, third or fourth degree, or laceration that went there, the bleeding, um, separation of the placenta from the uterine wall abruption, and so on. So they did see those complications, and they saw vascular complications. Four of them were lethal, iliac rupture after a fall during pregnancy, and aortic rupture either in labor or in one seven days out from a C-section. So these things happen, but they can also happen if you're not pregnant. Uh, the uterine, of course, is specific to pregnancy, and there were two uterine ruptures in their series, but not lethal, as well as several other non-lethal um, vascular events. So their conclusion was, if you don't have bad vascular complications before pregnancy, you can probably pursue a pregnancy. Um, but they did see a 5% you know, death rate during, you know, for patients who um, were pregnant with vascular EDS. And then what can you do? Hmm, how can I avoid this? So IVF has been recommended, and there was a case report, oh, look, we had a patient with vascular um, EDS, who, by the way, according to the Murray criteria, shouldn't have been pursuing a pregnancy because she'd had like multiple arterial aneurysms and dissections. They did a stimulated cycle, so got all the ovaries fired up um, and had a splenic artery rupture. Then they said, okay, we'll just take an egg every cycle, natural cycles, we won't stimulate. But that's, you know, trying to make an embryo every month from one um, egg retrieval. And after eight cycles, I think they finally got an embryo that they could transfer to the surrogate, and it was unsuccessful. So it, on paper, it sort of sounds like an option, but it's, you know, not one that has a high success rate. And then, um, where are we time-wise? Three minutes. <laughs> Relax. Um, so anesthesia, again, the older literature was very, oh, oh, this can happen, that can happen. Um, more recent studies seem to be very reassuring. Again, from my informal conversations with some patients, or not patients, participants in um, this conference, had pretty um, significant problems with spinal leakage from the spinal anesthetic, and that is a minute little needle, 25 gauge needle. So it's if you don't need anesthesia, you don't need to have it. But it's still, overall, the studies seem to indicate that people do pretty well with it. And also, um, the other thing, if you're getting a local anesthetic, say for a injury or episiotomy. Okay, now. Uh, injury or episiotomy repair, that um, you might need a little bit more drug, you might need a little more time for that drug to take effect. So that's something to, again, talk about with your um, caregiver ahead of time so that that's sort of mapped out and you're not there like shrieking and everybody's wondering why does, she, you know, what's going on. So it's kind of addressed. Um, and we talked about the risk of significant bleeding. Uh, yeah, one study said 19%, another said 10%, whatever it is, you want to be prepared for it. It's particularly, um, I think that 19% number may be more towards that vascular and classic ADS um, with the higher risk, but again, can happen and um, you need to be prepared for it. Um, and then the other complications that can occur, um, deep vein thrombosis, so mm, my leg is sort of swollen and hot and whatever, something's going on. Um, don't ignore it, you might need to get an anticoagulant. And coccyx dislocation, 
uh, you won't need anybody to tell you have that. You will know if it happens. Again, quite painful. Um, and again, I had somebody tell me, this did not happen during labor, but in the midst of the pregnancy. So unfortunately, these things can torment you for a while. Um, and again, so for management, evaluate the aortic root preconceptually, plan a delivery um, at a hospital that has full services, monitoring the cervix, definitely consult with the anesthesiologist, especially if there's scoliosis or a history of POTS or vascular or classical EDS, and make sure there's some DDAVP on hand in case there's a hemorrhage. Okay, and I think I made it in time. So I do not have, I was saying, I don't have any zebra pictures, but I love this little baby elephant picture I had. So there we go. So hopefully that is like walking off into a positive future, these little elephants. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for your attention.